It is Monday, September 2nd, and this is our Insider Access September Outlook. And so I should note that a portion of this is going to be made free and available to the public. I know that these are able to help everybody out, whether you're an Insider Access member or not. I post them to X. I include ideas, analysis, uh, and just hopefully whatever you're doing, wherever you are in your trading journey, maybe you're just learning, hopefully a professional lens and a different view to the market, aside from sort of the crazy furu noise of trade this calls that puts that, helps you calibrate, get a better understanding and take power uh, of your trading. So on that note, I wanna start with something we said from last week before I get into some spy analysis here. And a projection from last week's video that I posted was on Netflix. And what I said was that I saw Netflix breaking 700 for the week and pushing up to new all-time highs. Well, here's what happened last week. Netflix moved up, we were at about 674 to start the week, right? And we closed above 700, closed at 701, and we closed at all-time record highs. And so if you're curious, this was posted on X, there's nothing, there's no nonsense, I don't hide in the gray. Anybody who has followed me, anybody who is an Insider Access member knows, it's one of the things that drives me crazy is where people say, hey, I called this, I projected that, and it's all in vague, unclear language and buried somewhere you can't find. Uh, if you ever wanna check anything to reference things that I've said or posted, even if it's just guidance or to, to move things along that, to help you understand my notes, I leave everything up on X, I delete absolutely nothing. So it would have been on August 25th, I believe was the post, you can see, it was a video similar to this one. So uh, that was dead on for Netflix. From 674, we most certainly pushed up to 700 plus and we closed at all time record high. Speaking of which, I wanna talk a little bit about the health of the markets here and looking at the S&P 500 or the SPY. Okay, so let's, uh, let's maybe push over to the SPY here and take a look on a monthly basis actually, because I think that's important. So we had some turbulence in August and that's something that really presented an opportunity. So if you were looking at it on a daily basis, I actually saw this as an opportunity and everybody who's an insider knows this, is that when we pulled down and the markets were all screaming, it's, it's going to tank and a lot of my colleagues and peers, uh, professionals and fund managers were saying, you know, this is a big risk because of the jobs report, I actually explained to insiders and we, we went into deep analysis as to why I felt that was erroneous and that the non-farms jobs report was an error last month. And a big driver for that was that they were saying that they didn't factor in what had happened in Houston. And so Houston, over 2 million homes lost power uh, and there was a lot of unemployment claims that spiked if you looked on a state level. So I knew that there were some aberrations and errors, if you will, in that report because all the other proxy data showed that the jobs market was not in fact declining to that extent uh, on a month over month basis. And this sets aside the annual revisions that we have. So I said, it's an error report, it's caused panic. And those opportunities come along every now and then. When you get these errors in the market that cause panic, it creates opportunity. Now, that doesn't mean that when you see something crashing down, jump on it, it's an opportunity. It's only if you fully understand your position and why. I have a lot of experience, right? Or decades of experience. And so I knew that this was a miscalculation. I had my data, I had my spreadsheets out. I looked at the state level data. I was performing an analysis with my team of all across the United States. And we knew that the non-farms job report has been negative, uh, sorry, has been inaccurate in the past and they flat out admitted in their report that they hadn't factored, uh, that they didn't believe the Texas uh, hurricane causing 2 million loss in power and the unemployment claims there um, was an issue. Whereas we saw it as no, that's absolutely an issue and we're gonna see a bounce back. Plus we had an understanding of what we were expecting from other reports and what I explained to insiders was, we're gonna bounce back on the strength of other reports. You're gonna see inflation continue to come down and then we're gonna get some corrective data. The week over week unemployment numbers aren't going to be as negative and you're gonna see us rally back from these lows. So it was an opportunity. And what a lot of people missed was that we closed at a high when we pull back and look at a monthly level, right? This was actually a record high for the SPY. Now we didn't break the record peak that we touched um, previously, that we touched in July, but on a monthly basis, we closed at a monthly high. So this was the last monthly high, that was in July, and previous to that was obviously June, and previous to that was May. We made a substantial move up. We didn't see the same thing on the QQQ on account of a little bit more weakness from technology. So the Magnificent Seven, I think they're having some challenges, and we're gonna see a little bit of that manifest uh, in Q3 and Q4 here, but still turned a positive month. Now, XLK technology might have done poorly, but there's there's more to it. It's not just a matter of saying, okay, we closed positively, so that's a good thing going forward. I project that this month we will, at the very least, we're going to begin September with strength. Uh, that doesn't mean that tomorrow is gonna to be a big green day. What I mean is that the early portions of September, 
likely as we move along we are going to break 5700 that's my view I think that we challenge the recent highs uh, and we will get above the recent highs of course the recent highs were 56 69 67 I believe we'll break that this month uh, and I believe that 5700 or that zone is within striking range and we are likely to hit that point uh, what happens after that there's some nuance to the analysis and that's something that I'll get into with insiders later on in this video and very quickly I also want to add that what gives me confidence in the, the progression within the S&P 500 in particular, and this is not QQQ, is that we're seeing some of the sectors, some of the stronger, more heavily weighted sectors, again, uh, like XLV and XLF, which make up about 25% of the SPY, hitting all-time record highs, right? All-time monthly high closes, and this is XLV, that's healthcare. We also saw the same within XLF, all-time record highs. We also saw the same within industrials, right? That is XLI, all-time record highs and all-time monthly highs we also saw the same and we're not done all-time monthly high that's a record monthly high so we didn't uh, take up the peaks of where we've touched before but a record monthly close so that's on utilities industrials financials and healthcare so that's what we call a broadening out and i think that's very important so we'll switch back to uh, where we were now uh, from here i'm just going to jump ahead for everybody who's watching and talk a little bit about where we were just with day trading and range trading, right? So if you look at it, we were actually working within a range. There was a lot of volatility, but range trading, and this is something you need to be careful with and understand where you are. So when you identify a range, right? And this is something we did with an insider. So maybe I'll pull that up first. I identified that there was a clear range. And again, this, this leverages experience. I knew that there was a range. And one of the things you have to identify is potential catalyst. So if you just see something consolidating, it doesn't mean that it's going to last within that range and work within that range and obey sort of the high end of that range and the low end of that range, right? Because if you don't have the reason for consolidation, it means nothing, right? Then you're just reading patterns and saying, you know, you may as well look at the clouds and try and discern lottery numbers. You're just saying, oh, well, because it has this pattern, then it will adhere to that pattern. That makes absolutely no sense, right? Um, you need a little bit more than that. You want to create an edge, not just look at patterns that anybody can look at. So what I explained to insiders is we're working within a range. I don't see a very strong catalyst that would necessarily lift us out of here as a result. And that, that provides a lot of analysis. I look at all the data. I look at everything from ISM, manufacturing, used vehicle numbers, uh, inflation, jobs reports, geopolitical items. There's a lot going on there. But when you feel confident and you've identified a range, now you could start to work with the zones in that range. And I'll, and I'll just show that um, this was a trade idea that we had from Friday, right? So people wonder, how do you get these big asymmetrical risk opportunities? Well, I explained one way was to identify errors in market pricing, such as we had at the beginning of August. Those don't come around too often, but when they do, you absolutely pounce. When people talk about how to be a successful investor or a successful trader, I will simplify it and put it this way. And this is the hyper simplified version. You seek asymmetrical risk opportunities, meaning where you have big upside and then you manage and you cap your downside. And that's it. And you strike and you go heavy, almost like the way that a lion hunts, right? Lions are opportunistic. They're not eating 50 times uh, a day. They're opportunistic. They have their feast and then they wait and then they pounce, right? I, I'm not a big fan of all the analogies. I know and then there's snipers, a sniper waits. You get all the, the cheesy analogies, but the technical way to explain it is you seek asymmetrical risk opportunities. You don't just wait into a trade and eat 50 trades, right? I see people like that all the time. Those are the fastest people to burn and destroy their accounts. If I had to describe the most successful people, it's those who seek asymmetrical risk opportunities, who are patient. They don't care if it takes three days, two days, one day, five days. They're looking for that opportunity. Those are going to be the most successful, right? And if you look across the market and through history, those are the people who jump on it. When they see something that is worth their capital deployment, they take it, get a big upside. And if I had to summarize in the same fashion, the person who destroys their account, blows it up, but is, you know, has 50, buys five new monitors, gets into trading, is really hyped up, is really excited, goes wild for a little while, has some big wins, follows 50 furus, has some big losses, and eventually blows up their account, says, uh, investing isn't for me, trading's not for me. Maybe I'll buy a mutual fund or just, I'll, I'll tell everybody how the markets are rigged. Those are the people who need 50 trades a day. They're, they're really hyper. Oh, where's the levels? Where are the levels? Where, where are the calls? Give me the prime setup, the A double plus setup. You need to be patient and find asymmetrical risk opportunities. Okay, so to conclude that, let's move on. We had a range that was clearly identified, and I believe we will break out of this range. But that's what I identified last week. You see 830, and we had a potential rejection at 562.50, right? We just missed uh, hitting there, and then we targeted a zone, and we know how we work with zones. 
All right, we look for an inflection and a reversal, and we look for a bounce. Uh, something else I noted, I said, you know, if there's any updates, uh, any changes, Friday we expect hypervolatility into close. It's a potential. Uh, so I'll look to update if any changes. Of course, I didn't make any changes to this. And then I also explained that NVIDIA contracts and ER swings have resolved because there was a tremendous amount of volume on NVIDIA. But action on it is a bigger focus as it turns down may approach 16. I said if we hit 116, I see a bounce, and I think that will prime markets to drive up even further. Uh, and then just a little bit on one of our bullish trade ideas. So NVIDIA never hit 116, but turned up towards the end of the day. Let's take a look at how we worked on SPY. So I said 557 was our zone, right? Oh, let's get that right. 557, okay? And so here was 557. That 557 zone got right into it, didn't quite touch, and then absolutely exploded. And so what that results in is the following. Our next update into the day, uh, and I updated this a little bit later, was 651% move on uh, the 562 calls, 510% move on the 561 calls. And so when you see 651, if you calculate it, it'll look like 751, but again, you're getting some of your capital back and this would look like 610. Uh, and that went 39 cents to 293, and we went uh, 60 cents to 366. And that was a move right off a of range because you identified the range, you knew that there was strong support, looking for a bounce. So when you're working a range, remember what you're looking for is you can see the consolidated pattern, but then look and see if there's catalysts, right? If you're consolidating, going into earnings, I'm just making it really simple. Well, that's not consolidation. Then you're not looking for support and resistance points at the top and bottom of that range. You can't expect to tread within that range. Now you can also use some other advanced strategies. You can use strangles, you can use spreads to maximize uh, or to take advantage of operating within a range. But I think you get some really good play, particularly with something like SPY because the S&P 500, this is the ETF SPY because you get dailies, right? So you have tighter options uh, expiration dates, and that allows you to really get a high risk to reward ratio when you're confident in your entry points. So this was from Friday within Insider Access, 651, 510, uh, 60 to 366, and 30 cents to 293. I'll just pull those up really quickly. So let me pull that in right here. Um, so this was on the, this is on the 561s, and you saw, let's see here, I'll just have to back out. You know what, let me blow that up, okay? And so that we touched down at the bottom and we consolidated there for a while. So there's a lot of opportunity entry in that zone and go from 60 to, th oh, to 366. I didn't mark to 366. Actually, it was an even higher return. Um, we actually ran to 375. Interesting. Well, here's what it, I think that was a reason for that is I said, this is a closing update. So I provided my update two minutes before the bell uh, so I guess I missed the very last minute. This is where I provided my update and this was the peak. Um, and then of course we touched up to a little bit higher to 375. So that's what I get for putting in my update, uh, two minutes before the closing bell. Uh, but I, I don't think you're waiting to the very last minute to get out of your contracts cause you risk hitting the bell and then we move back, but you get the idea. The difference being instead of perhaps, uh, that would be 510%, you know, maybe 530%, you get the idea. And that's on the 561. And then of course on the 562, um, that was an even higher ROI that just barely hits our protocol. I don't like taking anything really outside of the, maybe about 40 to 80 cents zone for an intraday trade. And that obviously went up from 39. And then there we go, we mar I marked it properly on this one. So it probably went from the 561 to the 562 uh, and then marked it to 293. So you get the idea there. Um, but again, that's just a bit of a, a lesson in a tutorial of what to look for. You can have powerful opportunities when you're trading within a range. And this is a very strong range, right? You could see it's a wider range. Um, and then the other tip that I would give everybody for range trading is don't force yourself into really tight ranges, right? So I don't know, let's take a look on an intraday basis. If you're seeing something like this, right? This is more intraday sideways chop. That's not range trading. That's not what I do. That's not what we do within insider access. That's not an asymmetrical risk opportunity. If you say, okay, so 560, 55, and then my resistance is 561.85, right? You're now working within a dollar twenty range. That's not the way to work it, right? Or even tighter, if you're going here within a few cents, that's the person I described who needs to take a trade. Okay, okay, so this is my support, right? Because it's touched down here a few times and this is my resistance. That is horrible. Don't do that to your capital. Don't over trade. You may have a gambling addiction if that's the way you approach the markets, right? It's not a game. It's not fantasy football. It's not fantasy stocks. It's not... Um, you know, anything like that, respect your capital or just don't trade. Be patient until you can sort of build that up with yourself and you're actually serious and you want to succeed 
and you have the patience, then get involved with the markets. But please respect risk. This is not a range. When you back out and you can see a greater sort of range, let me just bring that down for us. So we've got a little overexpanded. You can see a greater range, like perhaps we see here, right? This makes a little bit more sense. Now you can identify some of the outlying points and you can see some of the points that I picked weren't the exact perfect area, uh, but it's based on a few other things. Because what I do is I start from the macro standpoint, then I start to narrow in on a lot of the items in terms of technicals. So that's it, guys, for the public portion. I'm going to move on to the private portion. Insiders, stay tuned. We have a lot coming up and a big outlook for September.